Hello, everyone. We are getting Instagram up and running. It looks like Instagram has said my connection is worthy. Get that adjusted a little bit there. That's a little better. It looks like we are good on Facebook, YouTube, Float, although I don't know if we're on Float right now because they're doing their um, migration over to version 1.0. So we might not be on float today, <clears throat> but um, we should be good on the other two, on Facebook and YouTube. All right, so we got people hopping on on the Instagram side. It's saying yes, I can see that. So how do I? There we go. Remove it. It, it is saying it's not being able to connect to float. That is fine. Maybe we can jump on Twitter today. Let's see. Maybe. I normally can only connect to three at a time. So, hey, since I'm not able to connect to Float right now, we will go live on Twitter. All right. So welcome, everybody. Um, just to give you guys a quick update, if you are seeing or hearing this after the live stream has happened, uh, we do these live streams every Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, next week is going to be um, slightly questionable. Uh, I'm going to be in Arizona. So what is that? Three. Is, I have to get the, cal the calculation right. I can't remember if I add or subtract. But it's two hours time difference from where I am now. So um, I can. I did test and I can do this uh, run StreamYard on my iPad. I will have my iPad with me. Let me make sure I write down. Don't forget the iPad because we're driving a rental car, so I have to move things over. And um, I am going to try and do it. I might be off a little bit. I, I might not be able to get to it till 5 p.m. that local time. So that may, I think that makes it 7 p.m. here. Because um, 3 p.m. is a little off. If that's the direction it goes, then yeah, it's going to have to be a little bit later. But anyway, we'll figure that out. Um, I will try to put an announcement out. Um, but if you are watching this afterwards, it's Thursdays, 5 p.m. Uh, we are almost always on um, YouTube. Uh, I did just, thank you to all of you that have started following me recently, I did just reach uh, over 300 on YouTube. That's not my primary platform. Uh, but what that means now that I'm over 300 is uh, we will be auto-filling, auto-downloading, uh, transferring, whatever you want to call it, uh, to Odyssey. So for those not familiar, Odyssey is a YouTube type platform uh, that is built on blockchain and cannot be modified. So it's censorship um, resistant. And, uh, and so it's a great place. And it also has an option to auto save the videos you put on your YouTube channel to your Odyssey channel automatically. So you can still just upload them to one place and they will come over to Odyssey automatically once you set that up. Uh, the benefit to that is if something happens and your YouTube channel gets deleted, you will have a backup for all of your content that you've created. So if you're into that kind of stuff and you do content creation, that might be something you want to look into. Um, what I, where I normally stream this is on Facebook, YouTube, and Float, F-L-O-T-E, which they are getting ready uh, in two days, I think. It should go live, the uh, version 1.0 uh, of the Float um, Dilly Bob um, float app, I guess, website, because they're not really running it as an app. And um, it's pretty cool over there. If you guys uh, haven't checked it out, they are also a censorship uh, free platform uh, similar to MeWe. And uh, so that's some good stuff. And if they ever get MeWe figured out where you can live stream over there, I will start adding that in. And then on my phone, which uh, if you ever watch the Instagram version and then the YouTube version, you'll notice the Instagram version. Uh, I'm usually not looking at you guys on Instagram, sorry. Um, but I'm running that on my phone separately because StreamYard does not uh, support Instagram as of yet. Okay, so um, that was the boring housekeeping. And uh, today we are going to be talking about building a full spectrum canine defensive capability. So uh, last week, no, it was earlier this week, it was Tuesday of this week, uh, I did a live stream with Nicole Sauce and John Willis at, uh, so John Willis is at SOE Tactical, uh, Special Operations Equipment uh, Tactical, and they build and make like backpacks and slings and all kinds of cool tactical stuff. And uh, and then Nicole uh, Sauce is at Living Free in Tennessee, and she uh, sells roasted coffee and kind of has a 
homesteading kind of event. And um, so, but they do this kind of group uh, live stream every week. And I was invited on this past week and John kind of got into some of the topics that um, I don't hit a lot. And, and one of the things he specifically uh, kind of jumped into and we hit it briefly is how do, how do you use dogs to set up a full defense of a property? And, and he was thinking and, and um, you know, like the question revolved around, you know, a piece of property, let's say 10 to 40 acres, right? So this isn't like a, a normal suburban yard. Uh, that would be a lot more simple and you're probably not going to need to like patrol a suburban yard and things like that um, if times get really tough. But that was one of the things they're kind of considering is, hey, with all this craziness, with the shortages coming, with all the stuff that's going on, um, how do we uh, make sure we have um, a full defense? And if we wanted to use dogs for that, how would we do it? So that's what we are going to jump into uh, today. So uh, before we do that, here we go. Intro is set up. This is going to be episode 104, and we are now starting the recording for the podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 104 of the Protection Dog Podcast, where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy. I'm your host, Joel Riles, and today we are going to talk about building a full spectrum canine defensive capability now we're going to be talking a lot about defense in general and how to defend a piece of property uh, from various different forms of attack everything from uh, like your criminal type of attack to um, somebody's coming to steal all your stuff kind of attack um, and then we're going to be talking about how to integrate dogs into that so um, it's not going to be full on um, defense in terms of like going through a military defensive tactics type of situation, but we're going to hit enough of it that in incorporating the dogs into it makes sense. But before we jump over into that, let's talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Fortress Canine. Fortress Canine is bringing you peace of mind through protection dogs. So Fortress Canine breeds and trains uh, Belgian Malinois, German Shepherds, and Dutch Shepherds. And we have three different levels of training. We call them personal protection, family protection, and executive protection dogs. Uh, you can think of them as level one, two, and three. And these dogs are trained to be safe around your family, to be safe around your other pets, to move uh, in public with safely, and yet to be fierce and hardcore in their protection work. Uh, we like to say that they are working dogs with an off switch. So if you would like to learn more information, please visit our website, FortressK9.com. That is F-O-R-T. R-E-S-S, -S, the letter K, the number nine.com. You can also email me, Joel, J-O-E-L, at FortressK9.com. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, MeWe, Float. Um, those are the big ones uh, by searching for Fortress K9. Um, if you find us on YouTube or Odyssey, um, please do not message me there and expect a response. I do try to respond if I see there's a comment, um, but I am not as active on the actual sites over there as I am all of the other social media platforms. So just please keep that in mind. All right. Um, one last um, kind of shout out. We have additional puppies on ground right now. If you're interested in getting a puppy from us and you do not want to wait six to 12 months, like is our normal waiting time. Um, we have some extra puppies on ground. We had some larger than expected litters. So if you are interested in getting one, it is a rare opportunity. Um, make sure you contact me. You can text me. Do not call me, but you can text me at 813-836-9244. And uh, let me know you're interested in getting a puppy and I will get you the information uh, that you need to make that happen. All right. So with that, let us jump into uh, today's topic. Now, I will say right up front, um, normally my uh, notes that I work off of for a podcast are like um, large print, like five to eight bullet points and um today's is fine print two columns of about 12 to 14 bullet points each so if i see that we are going long um, i will basically check our time at the halfway point and if it looks like we're going long then what i will do is we will uh we'll kind of pause it there and then we will do a part two on next week's live stream and i have some recordings i'm going to be doing on the drive but i won't be um I, I will wait and only record the part two of this on the live stream itself 
so that those of you who are joining and listening here and want to um, do that again next week, if we don't get through it all tonight, uh, you'll have the ability to do that. All right. Um, also, if you want the audio version and you want to hear any of our previous podcasts, uh, most of them are posted up on YouTube, but you can find all of our audio podcasts at Protection Dog Podcast. And that's available on almost any of the sites that are out there. All right, so let's jump into it. So first, when we're talking about defense, there's a couple of things. We're going to talk about a lot of big, and I'm opening my monster because monsters are delicious and I love them. We're going to be talking about a lot of um, overarching big defensive um, ideas tonight. And because of that, you're not going to be able to incorporate all of them. You may not even be able to incorporate most of them. But I want you to have a broader perspective on what it means to defend something. Because a lot of people think it's either going to be way too hard or they think it's going to be way too easy. And it's kind of somewhere in between. And we're going to get into some of that. But when we're talking about these big concepts, I want you to kind of think there's a version of perfection and then there's what we can do with the assets we have. Right. So we even deal with this in the military, which is, you know, we're supposed to have all of the stuff that we need to do defense and protection. Right. But when they go, OK, um, there's a brigade size element, which is several thousand people defending a specific space. And they're going to have a lot more assets like artillery, close air support, different things like that. Right. And depending on where they're located, they may even have like naval support and, and things like on a much grander scale. And then there's something like a platoon defending a combat outpost. Okay. And the concepts and the ideas are the same. The assets that you may have available and the capabilities you may be able to bring to bear um, are obviously smaller on a platoon, which is like um, 30, 40 people. Um, you're much smaller and much less capability in that situation than you are on the big one. But we start with the big concept. And then we incorporate as many things as we can that make sense and that apply in our situation. So uh, don't get overwhelmed when you start hearing some of the uh, the ideas and things that we're talking about. <clears throat> so first, think on, so we're, when we do this, we want to set realistic expectations. And the first way we do that is we think on a grand scale of perfection. If I could do everything I wanted to do, what would I do? What would I do if I wanted, if I could, you know, had unlimited funds, and could do everything and anything I wanted. Now, don't spend a huge, like, don't get into the weeds on this. I would get this many of these things and that many of those things. Think, you know, kind of like 3,000 foot view. Like, you're up there. I want to build this. This is what I would do if I could. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And at least get, like, a, a decent concept of what that would look like for you. And then go, but well, what can I do right now? And then start implementing the things that you can do right now. And then prioritize the things that are on your list of things you want to do. Um, both by finances, how much can you spend, and by what's the most important things that need to be added, and then slowly, incrementally build your capability and your defensive posture, all right? Then we're going to jump into the basic concepts of defense. So one of the basic concepts of defense is it takes a lot more people to attack a position and take it than it does to defend a position and keep it, <clears throat> okay? Now, there's some, some variations to that depending on a lot of different things. How hardened are you, right? So if you have concrete bunkers, um, then you can defend against a lot more, um, you know, fire coming in and stuff like that. If you are in a tent and, you know, you're, you're inside a, a, just a pop-up tent, um, <clears throat> you're not going to have much of an advantage, right? But as a general rule, it takes a lot more people to successfully defend a place, especially, you know, talking semi uh, equal capabilities, you know, everybody has guns, right? Um, it takes a lot more people to attack than it does to defend. Defenses should be set up in layers. And so if you lived in a suburb, for instance, your layers may be, what's the neighborhood, right? Does the neighborhood have a wall around it? Even if it's not like restricted access, um, if it has a wall around it, then people could come over the wall, but the most likely avenue of approach, that's a, an avenue of approach is something that's easy to travel down, right? The most likely avenue of approach is probably the roads, right? And coming through the big open spaces in the roads, especially if they want to bring in vehicles. If they're on foot, maybe they'll go over a wall. 
But if they're um, bringing vehicles, then they're probably not going to crash through a wall. Right. And so you may think of your your outer layer in a suburb as that wall. And then you have all the homes and all that kind of stuff inside. And there's different layers within that. If you're on a homestead, then your outer layer is probably your fence. Right. Or your, your property boundary. Um, if your property boundary is not fenced, you probably want to fence it uh, in some way or another to at least slow progress. <clears throat> so we're going to have these layers. So when we talk about dogs, I'm going to break it down into four basic layers. We have our outer perimeter. We have our in close to the house. Okay. And, and the house is kind of the, the hub of what we're going to be defending in this scenario. If your version, you know, modifies a little bit from that and, and the thing you need to defend most is not your actual house, then, um, then you can modify based around that. Then you're going to have your in your house layer. So the things that are actually inside the home, and then you're going to have your personal layer, which will move with you as you move around, right? So you may go to the perimeter to check something out and then come back. Whatever your personal layer of defense is will move with you, okay? And so those are going to be the basic ones. There, there are other ways to describe it and define it, and, and that's not really using military terms, um, but I want this to be kind of easy to understand for everybody. So that's how we're going to the, to describe this is setting this up in layers. And you also almost always use defensive positions in a defense. Okay. So your defensive positions can be multiple different things in the military. A defensive position is to at least it's like a hole in the ground, right? Like you use your entrenching tool, uh, you dig a fighting position, they call it. So you basically dig out uh, a little depression that you can lay in. And then you use a lot of that dirt to build up a little like protective layer around the front and a little bit down the sides of your uh, position so that when you're in it, you can shoot over the top of it. But if rounds are coming in, as little of you is exposed as possible, right? And um, so that would be one form of defensive position. Another form of defensive position would be like poured concrete that's reinforced with steel, right? And, um, and then there's everything kind of in between. So you can think of defensive positions on your property like cover versus concealment. And uh, so for those that don't know, cover is something that will block a bullet, right? So if you're behind cover and someone shoots at you, though, it will stop a bullet. Now it may not stop a hundred bullets, right? Hit, hit in the same place, but it will stop several at least. So think of it, if you're behind a non-filled concrete wall, so that's a concrete block that doesn't have concrete poured down inside of it, that's going to stop one or two rounds, depending on what the rounds are. If it's filled with concrete, that will stop almost any round, except maybe like a 408 and up, right? 50 cal, things like that. It won't stop them. Um, if you have the concrete wall and like quarter inch uh, AR500 steel or AR550 steel, which is what they make the steel targets out of. So you have a concrete wall first and then steel behind it, like plated steel, that's going to stop a lot more, right? If you have a big tree, big trees are great cover. Now keep in mind, trees, depending on where you are behind the tree, your cone that you're being covered from is can be fairly narrow. So it's easy to flank if you're using something like a tree, okay? A vehicle, especially if you're using the engine block. Now keep in mind, if you draw a fire toward an engine block, and that engine block takes a lot of uh, rounds, it's probably not going to run anymore, right? So that may or may not be something that you want to do is run behind a vehicle and use it for cover. Um, you can set up, like if you have piles of dirt or gravel, things like that, those will stop rounds, right? So you could uh, have those. And I'm not suggesting that you set up defensive positions where you actually have uh, pre-built positions on a homestead. Although if you wanted to go to that, level you could. Um, but I think you're, you're largely wasting time because I don't think we're going to be attacked by trained people. I'm just giving you the concepts, right? So having positions and knowing where those positions are and where you would go. So the reason this is important is you don't want to be wondering, will this tree stop rounds when somebody's shooting at you, right? You want to kind of look into that, see in general, in the military, they say you want something that's at least like 10 or 12 inches diameter. And if it's not 10 or 12 inches diameter, it's probably not worth getting behind, right? You want kind of like a big oak and, um, and, and up, 
you want you want bigger trees, right? Um, you may have like small structures, like a um, a well house that where your pump for your well is, and if that's built up adequately, that might be cover. Now, when we said cover versus concealment, concealment is something that you can get behind and they can't see you. Now, if they see you go there, they know you're there, but if they don't see you get there, you could be there and you could, you're, you're concealed from them, right? But if you're behind concealment and then they realize you're there, it's important to understand concealment doesn't stop bullets. Okay. So a bush may conceal you, but it's not going to cover you. Okay. So when you're looking around, you want to kind of start making mental notes about where could I move from position to position to position on my property and have cover if somebody were shooting at me. Right. And this doesn't have to be, you know, um, a motorcycle gang, like in all the, you know, prepper porn novels, the motorcycle gang is coming for you, man. Um, I don't know, maybe that'll happen. And may I'm sure it happens to some people. Right. But it, I don't think that's going to be a, um, big popular thing that's going on, even if it gets really, really bad in the US. But, um, you know, you, it could apply to a situation like that, where you have an organized group that's doing a coordinated attack against you. Or this could be uh, three dudes who are walking down the street, and they realize, hey, there's a house, we should go see if they have anything that we can take, right? Because we're hungry, and we haven't eaten in a while. Or they're just criminals, okay? In a defensive situation, we will often incorporate something called patrolling tactics into the defense. So what this means is a patrol is where you go walk around. Okay, so let's just simplify it down. In a patrol, you're walking around with guns. Now, there are ways to do it correctly and there are ways to do it incorrectly. Okay, but uh, and I'm not going to get into patrolling tactics today. If you guys are interested in that, let me know and we can do some um, patrolling with canine um discussions. But for this, the uses of this is the application in this situation, if you're on a homestead or a large piece of property is patrolling is basically, Hey, I'm going to get my gun and then I'm going to go check out what's going on over there because I think there might be a person over there, or I heard a noise over there, or the dogs are barking and looking in that direction. And I'm going to go check it out right now. Again, there are smart ways to do that. And there are dumb ways to do that, but that's what patrolling is. Now, when you start to patrol, here's what's important to understand about that. You essentially transition from the defender to the attacker, assuming that that person that's out there is there to cause your facility harm. Okay. So the person that's moving forward into a fight is usually the one that's at the disadvantage. If, if all the person has to do is stay in this spot and hunker down and return fire, you have an advantage, assuming that your spot is cover, right? That, that it will generally block bullets coming in. And it doesn't guarantee you're going to win. It doesn't guarantee you're going to lose. It's just you're at an advantage if you don't have to move, if you can stay in your spot and you can return and shoot, right? And especially if they're not 100% sure. So now you're going out to patrol. You're not 100% sure who it is or that it's even a person. You just heard something. The dogs are looking in that direction and barking. I'm going to go check it out. Is it a scared little kid that got lost? Or is it a dude that's got an AR-15 and seven round, fully loaded rounds of magazines and he's waiting to shoot at you, right? You don't know what it is. So having that lack of knowledge puts you at a disadvantage. So just keep that in mind. It's not that patrolling isn't good, but there are ways to do things where you minimize your own risk. One of those ways might be using something like game cams, right? Especially if you have game cams that um, send pictures and videos to your phone, right? So they, they transmit and, um, and this isn't a grid down situation. And you're like, Hey, uh, I just got a notification on my game cam. That's over in that part of the property that it picked up movement. And I looked at my phone and it's a dude and he's wearing, you know, camo clothes and has a rifle. Hmm. Is it hunting season? Maybe he's just trespassing or is he here to be a bad, bad guy? I don't know. So that's one way you could do it using cameras in various different ways. Um, you could also use a drone. Right. Or you could go send the dogs to check it out, depending on whether they're in or outside of your perimeter. And we're going to talk about perimeter dogs uh, in a bit. Uh, but you, you would often include or incorporate patrolling tactics into your defense. So what you want to do, the, the whole purpose of a patrol outside of what we would call the wire downrange, um, but outside of your property, outside your fence line, or you might do it right along your fence line. What you're doing is you're looking for probes. And what a probe is, is when 
you're getting ready to attack a place, you will do multiple things. You will recon. That means you're going to go and observe and gather information. And you're going to be like, you know, how many people do they have defending this place? What kind of weapons do they have? Do they have dogs? Do they not have dogs? What kind of fences and obstacles are there? Uh, where can we bring vehicles through? You know, how can we get on the property with vehicles? Those are all things that you would gather during a recon. Okay. And then based on your recon, uh, and typically this is like a multi-day, multi-week process, right? People will come in, they'll recon, and then they'll go back and they'll all compare notes and, you know, they'll have sketches and information written down and stuff like that. And then they'll discuss it. And then they'll say, we need to know this additional information. So then they go back and they start trying to gather more information. Now, when you talk about gathering uh, more information, the information might be, if we cause a distraction here, what do they do, right? How do they react? So that would be like a probe. Like you may come in and you may even shoot around at them, right? Now, if you do that, then they're going to know somebody's out there and they're going to be on higher alert. Um, or you could come and you could shake the fence and make noise and get the dog's attention and then back away. And that person that did that probably now then runs away. But then you have other people that are observing the property and seeing, does everybody run there? Do two people go and other people cover them? What do they do? And then they use that to build a plan, right? So when you're patrolling, you're trying to kind of catch these people before it happens, or you're looking for signs that they've been there, right? So if you're walking around, walking around, walking around, and you get super familiar with your space and you know where everything is, and, and then you walk and then something's out of place, it's like, why is that out of place? Is it possible that somebody here used it and didn't put it right back in the same spot it was? Or is it something that's been there a long time and shouldn't have been moved? Um, it, is there a like a game trail there? You know, something where you can see that somebody has walked in and out and they've disturbed the brush and, and there's an obvious push through the brush. Things like that you're looking for and you're, and you're like, okay, if I'm seeing that, then it means there's a possibility at least that people are out moving around our property and then you may go to a higher level of alert. If you walk around and you don't see anything, then you're probably going to be at a lower level of alert, right? Until you kind of have a reason to. Um, so the benefits of being the attacker are doing your recon, making your plan, all of that kind of thing. The attackers pick the time they attack, right? The attackers pick the way they attack. And if they've gathered information well, the, the attackers will probably have a decent idea of where some of your weaknesses are. So those are the benefits of an attacker. The benefits of a defender are you don't have to... Uh, go move toward a threat, right? You And you can also set your place up to be how you want it. You're also probably more familiar with your location than they are. So if there's certain things that you have that are hidden or concealed, right, then you may know about those things, but they may not know about those things. And you can basically hunker down in a position and return fire. And unless you're overrun, meaning that you're you know, there's too many of them coming and you can't hold them off, then you drop back to another layer of defense, right? So that's why we have these layered concepts. Okay, so now how do we add dogs into this, right? So these are the basic concepts of adding dogs into defense. Number one, remember we were talking about patrolling? Dogs are amazing detectors. They can detect when people are on your property, right? Long before you can probably. So whenever your dogs bark in a direction or, or are staring in a direction, we call it alerting. Their ears are, are up. If they're a pointy ear dog, they're both facing forward. They're not out to the sides. They're both straight forward and they're looking intently in a direction. If they're doing that, then that's an alert and you need to pay attention to it, right? So they offer you the ability to detect. Now it could be a coyote. It could be a squirrel or a rabbit, or it could be a person but you don't want to ignore those things, okay? Uh, dogs are also a deterrent. So if people know that you have a dog, then they're probably going to go, we need to do something about that dog before we go attack this place. Or they're gonna go, we don't wanna attack this place, they have dogs. When you talk about getting rid of a dog, there are ways to do it that are fairly easy. And there are ways to defend against it. So one of the easiest ways to get rid of a dog is to take something like a steak or a piece of meat and soak it in radiator fluid and then throw it over a fence. Radiator fluid is deadly for dogs. 
and they will, and it generally tastes sweet too. So you don't ever want to leave radiator fluid uh, around in an open container because dogs and cats, it apparently has, <clears throat> excuse me, it apparently has a sweet flavor to it. I've never drank it, but that's what I've been told. And so they will drink it and then it will kill them. And it's apparently extremely painful. I've never seen a dog die from it, but I know that they do. So if you soak meat in it and then throw it over a fence, uh, when the dog comes and goes, oh, look, a treat just for me and eats it, um, then that dog dies. Now, if something like that happens and you just mysteriously suddenly find your dog dead, as far as you can tell, there's not any in injury to your dog. Um, there's probably a good chance somebody killed that dog, right? Now, what can you do about this? So what we do with protection dogs, and, and it's a little harder to do this if your dog's not protection trained, but with protection dogs is we start to train our dogs. We call it poison proofing. And we start to train our dogs that anybody who tries to give you food is a bad guy, except me. I'm the only person who's allowed to give you food. If anybody else tries to give you food, you know what you should do? You should attack them. That's what you should do to people trying to give you food. And, um, and then, of course, there are things you have to be aware of once you've trained a dog to do that, right? So we don't do it with all of our dogs because, number one, it's time consuming. And number two, um, you know, when you go through Starbucks and they go, does your dog want a puppuccino? And they try and hand your dog food. You don't want them breaking through the window and biting the poor uh, little um, barista there. Okay. Um, but they are deterrents. So be aware of people trying to take your dogs out. People can shoot dogs. Now, if, if you see your dog shot, then that's very, very obvious. You know, that's a bullet wound and somebody shot my dog. We're probably going to go look for that person, or at least we're going to be on high alert waiting for something to happen. Solutions to this. Have multiple dogs, right? It's hard to take out six dogs before you know something's going on. They might take out two, but you see one dog go down, you see a second dog go down. At that point, we're going hunting, right? I'm not sitting around and waiting because uh, dogs don't really know how to get behind defensive positions unless I just tell them, go there and lay down, right? So... <clears throat> Keep that, that kind of stuff in mind if anything like that starts to happen. Um, in uh, a lot of places in the suburbs or in the like, kind of project type areas where they're, they're bad neighborhoods, when people want to rob somebody that has a dog, they often will do that. They will often throw um, meat soaked in poison over the fence and then uh, wait for the dog to die and then come and rob the place afterwards. Okay, So that's a normal thing even in um, peacetime uh, for people to do. All right, so dogs can work in teams with other dogs or with units of people or both, okay? So when we say teams with other dogs, what this means is dogs that will deploy and fight a person together without turning on each other, okay? And if you watch our videos on Instagram, uh, we have lots of videos that show that. Um, I think, uh, you know, within the last year, we were doing as many as five dogs at one time, um, and three of these dogs knew each other and the two of these dogs knew each other, but the, the pair of two and the pair of three, they didn't know each other and they didn't care. They would come in and they would deploy and they would fight just like, um, they were supposed to, they were all dogs trained by us. And so, um, that's a way you can deploy dogs together as a group, right? Then you can work dogs in a unit of people. So, uh, and we'll get into that more if you guys are interested in patrolling tactics with dogs. But basically, you can incorporate the dog into a patrol. Now, you can do that in a couple different ways. You can have the dog, I tell the dog, patrol out. And what I want them to do when I tell them to patrol out is to go about 30 to 60 feet out in front of the point man and to kind of look around and check things out, right? And then when you train dogs to do this, you train them to check back with you frequently. So they're kind of looking back, looking back at you. And when they do that, I use my hands and I direct them which direction I want them to go. And then I turn that direction and I start walking and they'll, they'll swing around and they'll get in front of me. So they're, they're right in front of the direction of travel I want to do. Right. So that's not really hard to train. It's a lot of fun to work with the dogs that way. Um, but you can have the dog out there. So they're out kind of checking things out in the front and they'll, they'll let you know if somebody's that it's not supposed to be. Another way is you can have the dog move in the unit. And then if you start taking fire from somebody, you can send the dog out. When I say unit here, don't get stuck on a military unit. This could be a dad and his son going to check out a, a disturbance on the fence line, right? And you take your dog with you. But when you take your dog with you, the dog needs to know how to move and work with you for that situation or there's no sense in taking them, right? Otherwise, they probably just get in the way. So make sure if you're planning on doing something like that, that you actually take the dog out and check anytime you have a disturbance so that the dog is used to what to do and how to move and, and how to organize that thing. And then depending on the size of your group, 
Um, it could even be two people and two dogs, right? Or it could be seven people and four dogs. So you can include more than one dog in these groups and you can build this unit based on what do you have and who's going to go check this out and who's staying back at the house and, uh, and that sort of thing. And then, um, like firearms, dogs can be used on people at a distance. Okay. So one of my buddies that uh, teaches a lot of courses, um, often says, what's the benefit of a gun over a knife? And the benefit of a gun over a knife is that you can use it when the person is farther away from you. If the person is right next to me, I would rather have a knife than a gun because guns are easy to take if I can get within arm's distance of you. The idea is you shoot the person before they can get within arm's distance of you, right? But guns are lethal force. Knives are lethal force. What can I use that I can send at a distance that I can justify the use of force that's not going to kill somebody if they were just doing something stupid, right? But they weren't there to really cause harm, okay? And that thing is the dog. And if your dogs are trained in a way to detect aggression, they go out there and that person truly is like a lost person and they just stumbled onto your property and they don't know where they are and, and they're trying to figure out how to get somewhere. When the dog gets there, they might get a little tag from the dog, but as soon as all they do is like, ah, the dog's gonna go, hmm, you're not fighting me. Mm, okay, um, I'm gonna go back to my person, right? And sometimes they'll watch the guy or the girl, whatever, whoever it is. Sometimes they go back to the person. A lot of it depends on the dog's personality and how you train them. But if the person's not fighting the dog, if the person's not being aggressive, the way that our dogs are trained, they generally don't fully engage with that person. They, they start to bite and then they usually kind of come up and do a little tag. And then they're like, mm, you're not fighting. I don't know why you're not fighting, but the people I rip up, they fight. So I'm going to go back to my person. And um, so you, you send your dog out, you see somebody go, ah, or you hear a, you know, a scream or something about pain. And then your dog comes running back to you hey, we well, should go check that out because that's probably not a bad guy, right? It's probably somebody who is having an issue and we need to go help them. We figure out what's going on. And a little tag is much better than shooting at somebody who's walking around on your property, right? Um, so you can use your dogs at a distance. If somebody starts to shoot at you from a distance and you don't know where they are, if your dog's been trained to do this, you can send your dog hunting. And if you have multiple dogs, I would send multiple dogs hunting and... I can kind of create a distraction by, you, if you somebody's shooting at you, you're gonna have a general idea of where they are, right? Because you're gonna hear the blast most of the time unless they're shooting suppressed or whatever. But even then, even with the sonic crack and the echo and reflections, if you're somewhat similar with, with you know, what firearms sound like, you'll probably have a, like they're in that general area somewhere, right? And you can fire a round or two in that area and make them think, oh, they're shooting back at us right? Because if they can't see you clearly, they don't know if you're shooting right at them or not. And then, so their head's kind of down a little bit and that gives those dogs an advantage when they come in hunting. Okay. So that's just uh, a way that you can work some of these things. If somebody runs and hides in the bushes, right? Somebody's like peeking in your window and then you're like, Hey, who the hell are you? And you run outside with your dog and they're not there, but you, you hear over on the corner bushes, you can deploy your dog over there and check that out. Now keep your legal restrictions in mind. And depending on, you know, where you live and what's going on in the world at the time, um, that may be a really bad idea or it might be a really good idea. It's just things to keep in mind as you're building these ideas and these concepts. Okay, so let's talk about building teams of dogs. So there's pros and cons of having multiple dogs, one dog, two dogs, three dogs. The biggest thing to understand with this is when you have one dog, you have defense, right? Like personal defense, maybe in your house defense, right? When you add two dogs, you don't get defense times two. You get defense times six. Okay, it's it's like an exponential curve. It, it's you add one extra dog, and it's not twice. It's way up here, right? It's a lot more. You add three dogs, and it's like the equivalent of having twenty or thirty. Okay, <clears throat> the reason for that is when dogs are fighting with a person. If you only have to focus on one dog, then you have a decent chance of fighting that dog. Now, you're probably going to get tore up, but if you're like willing to fight that dog, you're probably going to be able to beat one dog. 
and, and I'm, you know, when I say you, like a person that can reasonably fight, if you can reasonably fight and a dog attacks you and you don't lose your mind and, and go into panic mode, then there's a moderate chance you're going to kill that dog, like moderate 70 plus percent. Okay. You're going to go to the hospital afterwards. You may never use your hands right again, but you can probably beat that dog. Then you have two dogs. Now you turn your attention to the first dog that's biting you. And the second dog either starts biting the hands that you're trying to use to fight that dog, or they start biting you in the legs and ripping chunks of your calf off. Right. And then you add a third dog into that. And now you're just basically screwed. Okay. So it's, there's an exponential curve. Now the, the downsides to having multiple dogs are number one, you have to feed them. Number two, you have to buy them in the first place. Right. So multiple dogs are more expensive than one dog. And, um, you have to be able to control that many dogs. You as a handler have to have the respect of those dogs to be able to control them. That doesn't mean it's particularly hard. It just means you have to spend time learning your craft and knowing what you're doing in that situation, much more so than you would with just one dog. Because you you have a lot more room for error with one dog. With multiple dogs, you don't have as much room for error. Okay, So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So the... Um, when you're doing this, you decide, am I going to look at adding multiple dogs into this or do I want to keep one? I like the idea of multiple dogs if you understand how to use it and if the dogs are trained to operate together under stress. Okay. Um, one way that you can do this, if you're interested in getting multiple dogs but don't have the money to buy three or four trained protection dogs, is you get one dog that's trained and then you get a couple of puppies and you bring those puppies along with that dog for a while and then find somebody that can help you do the, the protection training on those puppies once they get to age. But they'll follow along with the dog that has the higher level of training and they'll pick up and learn a lot from that dog. Um, it may not be as ideal and it does take a little bit more time and energy on your part, but it's a definite uh, option when you're looking at, well, I want to add three dogs to defending my property. How do I do that? I can't afford you know, three times 20,000 or three times 40,000, um, I need to figure out how to do this on a more reasonable uh, basis, right? So that's just something uh, to keep in mind as you're looking at all of that. And then um, now we're going to talk about our layers of defense. So our layers of defense, we mentioned it briefly before, are the perimeter, are close to the house, which is basically when I say close to the house, I'm saying everything from standing by your house to where you can throw um, like a rock or a baseball, Okay. And, uh, and then you have inside your home, and then you have your personal layers. So let's run through those briefly. So building your perimeter layer. So if, I played soccer when I was a kid, so it kind of makes sense to me to kind of think about um, how these dogs are going to operate in these areas based on soccer positions. So in soccer, the guys that are trying to score are called your strikers or your forward. Typically, your striker is the center forward, but your forwards are the ones out there. And they kind of wait around down near the, the other team's goal, you know, or somewhere in that end of the field so that when your team gets it, you can kick the soccer ball up to them and then they can get it and run up and then try and score, right? And then you have midfielders. These are the guys that kind of will run back and help with the defense and then run up and help with the offense, right? And then you have your defenders and then you have your goalie, right? Okay, so your perimeter dogs are kind of like your forwards or your striker. And, um, and so what they do is they patrol the perimeter. So when you have a perimeter dog, you have to train the dog to know the perimeter. And then these are almost always bite first, ask questions later dogs. So that's, you have to ask yourself, is that a type of dog I want? If you live in a urban or suburban area, probably not a dog you want. If you live in a rural area and you have people over frequently, probably not a dog you want. But if you are in a rural area and very few people should be on your property, then this may be a really good idea. Or I have people over frequently, but I can contain the dogs and have this pathway that the people that come over can come down, that the perimeter dogs can't reach them or us. They're, they're buffered there, right? Um, but just keep that in mind. The, the value of a perimeter detection dog a perimeter dog is when it sees somebody in the perimeter, it attacks that person. That's what its job is, right? So you need to make sure that that's what you want on your property, right? The places we've trained dogs for this far, like RV um, sales places, sales lots, right? They have the big fences all the way around, but they'll often have perimeter dogs in that area 
at nighttime when the they close up at the end of the night they open that dog kennel up and the dogs go out and they basically guard that whole area and then they know the person who lets them out of the in the evening and they know the person who comes and opens in the morning those people are okay everybody else is a bad guy right so that's what you're talking about there so there's a couple of things that i typically want these dogs to do number one i want them poison proofed because they're the ones most at risk if someone's going to try and poison the dogs and number two your next biggest threat to these dogs are being shot at right by somebody who's watching the property and they go they got dogs there they are let's shoot them and take them out okay number one i don't want one dog out there if i can help it i'd like to have multiples ideally three and ideally two teams of three now again we're talking big scale break it down to what fits for you right but assuming that you have an ideal situation if somebody's going to shoot at your dogs if that's a possibility and that's something that you consider may be, may happen, then I want to train my dogs to be firearms initiated. And what I mean by firearms initiated is you hear a gun blast and it's not us, the, the group that you know, you go bite the person shooting that gun, right? So they, they're trained to target firearms sounds primarily and to go and attack that person. And so when you have three dogs, and let's say they hit one of the dogs, right? So you have three dogs and one of them gets shot. The other two hear that gunshot and immediately go attack, right? Then now you have a much higher level of security on that property. Now you need to keep things in mind, like what are the laws if the dogs go off property and bite somebody? But of course, this person has shot at you. So deploying dogs on someone who has shot one of your dogs, you're probably going to be okay. Um, But you want to know your area, right? You want to make these ideas and these thoughts um, and these plans with knowledge of your local laws, restrictions, all that sort of thing. So that at least if you decide you're gonna break the law, you knew what risk you were taking when you took it. Okay, the next one is your uh, close house, the, the layer to the, that's close to your house, right? The area outside your house, but close to your house. Okay, so what you have here is, these are kind of like the midfielders in the soccer team. Now remember we talked about the midfielders, they'll, when the um, forwards, get the ball, the midfielders run forward with them and help them try to score. And then when the ball goes back down the other end and they need to defend, they run back and they help the defense out too. So they kind of do both, right? So if you're fleeing into your home because somebody's coming and you're like, our safest place is to be inside the house, let's go. And you run inside your house, you probably want to take these dogs with you, right? But if you're outside doing things, You probably want these dogs outside doing things with you and you want to make sure that these dogs are good with your perimeter dogs because they're probably going to go interacting with them right but their job is not to walk the perimeter like the perimeter dogs are their job is just to kind of hang out maybe on the porch or something like that right up in the area around the house so you're establishing a close perimeter now you can do this multiple different ways you can establish your perimeter a couple ways when you're teaching the dogs the perimeter The way I prefer does take a little bit longer, but you basically walk the dog um, around the perimeter and whenever they go where they're not supposed to, they get a correction and they get told patrol the perimeter, patrol the perimeter, patrol the perimeter. And when they're, when you're walking the perimeter and they're walking it, I praise them. Now, if your property is big enough in order to uh, keep them from being poisoned, maybe what you want to do if your property is large enough is stand right outside your fence Take a piece of meat, get somebody who can really throw if you can't, and throw that piece of meat over the fence, figure out how far you can throw it, add 10 or 15 yards to that, and have your dog stay inside that area. Teach them that that's the perimeter, right? You may even have like a secondary fence in there. So you have your external fence and then an interior fence that is where the dogs walk, right? So... The other way that you can do this, and this is effective for your close perimeter dogs, especially if you don't want them going out where the other dogs are, is you can use something like an invisible fence. And you put the collars on them, you put the invisible fence in place, you turn everything on. And after a couple of months, they don't need the shocks anymore. They know where the perimeter is. They'll move around within that, but they, as a general rule, won't go over it, won't go through it. Right? And if you do decide to get an invisible fence, my recommendation is get the ones that when they go through the line, it activates and it doesn't turn off until they come back, right? And I don't know if they may all be like this now, but the original, some of the earlier invisible fences, the dog would get shocked when it was like six feet from the line, right? So I think it got like a buzz at six feet and then at like three feet, it started to get shocked. Well, some of the dogs would learn real quick. If you just run through that, you get 
you know, a couple seconds of a ride, but then it's over and then you're free to run and do whatever you want. Right. So they set ones up that if the dog goes outside the perimeter, they start getting shocked and it doesn't stop until the batteries run out or they go back into the perimeter. Right now, when you do this, you have to teach the dog why they're being shocked. So you still walk the dog on the perimeter, but I give them enough lead that they can get into where they would get shocked. And then when they're like, ah, I don't like that. I pull them to where it's safe and I go, good perimeter, good perimeter, right? If you're just doing it in your yard, you might say good yard or whatever you, word you want to use to teach the dog to stay in the yard. All right. So you're going to establish your close perimeter. You're going to figure out where you want them to be and you're going to train the dogs to stay in there. I also am probably wanting to do a firearms initiation attack on these dogs as well. Um, if you don't know how to do that, be careful with it because your dog has to be stable with you shooting and understand that if there's incoming rounds, I go and attack that person. Okay. And that's a, it's a specific way that the dog is trained to do that. So make sure um, if you're getting into that, that you have somebody who knows what they're doing when they're training dogs to be firearms initiated dogs. Okay. Um, there's, there's also other ways of initiating firearms dogs um, for snipers. Like if you're on an entry team and you have a sniper support, a lot of times entries are sniper initiated where the sniper fires their round and then the team goes in and does their thing. And um, if you're doing dogs for that, then you're training the dogs to initiate on gunfire, but not to go after the gunfire to go in and clear a house on gunfire. So you're basically training the dog to take an action when they hear a firearm go off. Okay. Then um, these dogs, now if you want them to assist your perimeter dogs, like the midfielders we were talking about, then you probably don't want to do the, the hardcore perimeter, right? You want to just kind of teach your dogs to stay up close near the house. And there are various different ways to do that other than the, um, the invisible fence thing. Um, but if you don't want them to go out, if your perimeter dogs are kind of like your guard dogs um, and then your close house layer dogs are your more advanced dogs that are outside, then you may say, hey, perimeter dogs can fall back here, but we're not going to go out there. Right. We're not going to go out and send those dogs out where they're at risk. We're going to keep them close until we need them. Um, so these are all decisions you have to make. And if you're interested in getting more into the planning aspect of this, I have lots of episodes on how to plan. Uh, for threats and things like that. So you can go back and listen to those. Uh, remember, it's Protection Dog Podcast. Um, okay, and the other one is assisting the house dogs. Now, regardless of whether you do the perimeter, they're, they're assisting the perimeter dogs or not, these dogs are going to assist the house dogs as needed, okay? So what that means is if I need to go in the house or if I've got a dog that doesn't have a job to do right now, um, I'm gonna send that dog into the house to help protect the family that's in there um, should that ever happen, right? Should I ever need to do that? And so those would be um, the big thing about these dogs is even if you only have one of these dogs, they need to be good with other dogs and they need to be good deploying and fighting with other dogs and not turning on the other dogs. OK, because they're going to be moving and interacting back and forth doing this kind of stuff. So it's important to keep that in mind. Then you got your house layer. So these dogs are going to come in contact uh, with the close layer dogs. Um, and they're going to be using the bathroom out there and all that kind of stuff when they're out there with them. Um, you may feed them out there with those dogs and then they come back in the house, right? Now, I always recommend if a dog is staying in a house is their primary thing. I recommend trying to get them at least an hour or two of um, time out uh, every day and whatever the climate is. If it's super cold and freezing, they're out for an hour a day. If it's really hot, they're out for an hour a day. Now, if it's hot, I make sure they have shade and water. If it's cold, I make sure they have a house with straw in it, right? So they have things. But what that does is it helps them acclimate to your year-round weather. And if you're doing it every day, um, so what I like to do is feed them and let them use the bathroom out there. So I take them out. I either will tether them to something uh, or I'll have a space that's a contained space. I'll put their food down. I'll let them eat. They have their chance to use the bathroom. And I just leave them out there for an hour. And then when they're done, I come out, I check, make sure they ate. I make sure that their poop is okay. Um, you know, we don't need to give them medication or anything. And then I bring them back inside, right? So that's an easy way to do that rotation. Um, but they're going to be interacting with the dogs that are just outside. So you want to make sure that they're good with those dogs. They're familiar with those dogs, but they're not spending all their time out there. They're spending most of their time inside. So these, you can kind of think of them as the family dogs, right? The family protection dog. And then... You can build suspicion in these dogs if you want to, 
and there's different ways to build suspicion. But basically what su building suspicion means when we say it is that when somebody comes in the house or on the property that they don't know, they bite them. That's what building suspicion is. So if you say, I want a dog that will protect my house when I'm not home. That means when you're not home, some bad guy comes in the house, your dogs are going to bite them. You do that by building suspicion in the dogs. If you don't build suspicion in the dogs, some dogs will naturally become suspicious. But if you move with your dog a lot, if you take your dog places, if your dog is well socialized, then they probably are not going to be suspicious naturally. And so if somebody comes home or somebody comes to your house, not to their home, to your house, and they're not supposed to be there and your dog is there and they don't act aggressively toward your dog, your dog might bark a little bit, but he's probably going to go, mm, he's not acting aggressive. He's just kind of moving normal. I'm not comfortable with this situation, but I don't know if I'm allowed to bite this guy. And there's a decent chance they won't. And if the person acts real friendly, and your dog is used to having friendly people interact with them. And your dog might go, I don't know what you're doing here, but you're pretty friendly. So, hey, you want to give me some scratches behind the ears? And so just because you have a protection dog doesn't mean that you have a dog that's going to defend in that situation because there's not, no person there to defend, right? If you want a dog to defend a house, you create suspicion around the house, not the people, okay? When you want a dog to defend a perimeter, you create suspicion around the perimeter not the people. And so somebody comes in your perimeter, they get bit. Somebody comes in your house, they get bit. The thing to consider when you're doing this though, is once you train a dog to do that, you don't untrain that. It's pretty much there. And um, now you can do some work, but you will never reliably leave that dog at home and have one of your friends that the dog doesn't know safely come over and take care of the dog while you travel, something like that, right? Um, so just keep that in mind. But having suspicion in the dogs can be a very good thing for defense, um, but it's something that does have its limitations and you need to keep that in mind when you're making your planning, okay? So that's your pros and cons of the bite first, ask questions later kind of dogs. So if you are if you have a situation where potentially somebody's gonna come in and you don't know they're there until it's too late, having a bite first, ask questions later dog can be a really good thing. If you don't want that liability and you like having friends and guests over to your house, then having a bite first, ask questions later dog is probably not a good idea for you. So uh, that kind of helps you think through that. And then your personal layer. So these are kind of like your goalkeepers, right? So, so your house dogs were like your defenders and then your, your personal dogs are like your goalkeepers. Now, depending on how big your family is and how responsible each member of your family is, how old they are, like I wouldn't have a protection dog for an eight year old, right? But I might have a protection dog for a 14 year old, depending on the 14 year old. So, um, these are going to be personal dogs to each member of your family that you want to have a dog and that you can trust to have a dog. And if you can't trust them with a firearm, you probably can't trust them to have a protection dog. Okay. So that's just kind of a, a way to think about it as you're going through things. So, um, but you're going to basically train these dogs up as your personal protection dogs. And then you want them to be very smooth moving with you. So these are dogs that as often as you can, they're going to be at your side. If you're out working in the shed, they're out in the shed with you. If you're out mowing, they're at the very least like kind of hanging out on the back porch, right? Watching you mow. Um, if you're going for a, a run or you're out hiking on a trail, these dogs are at your side, right? They're with you as often as you can have them with you so that you move smoothly together because under stress, if you find yourself defending yourself, you're not going to move smoothly. And so you want the dog to be very comfortable understanding how you move and you understanding how they move so that they don't get right in front of you just as you need to run forward and you trip over your dog. Now you're pissed at your dog. Maybe you or your dog are injured depending on what you landed on, pavement, rocks, things like that. And you get um, you get upset, right? Or you get distracted and you get hurt, killed by the bad guys um, because you fell down when you were supposed to be running, okay? And uh, I'm looking over here. My wife just wrote crazy honor. Oh, crazy Aunt Sally drill. Yeah, a little uh, thing there. Yeah. So when we do the um, the home invasion dogs, we do the home invasion training for the dogs. I have what I call an, a crazy Aunt Sally drill. And um, so we show the dog it's okay to deploy in the house. It's okay to bite somebody in the house. It's okay to, to defend the house um, because normally we're telling our dogs, you know, don't put your teeth on these things, leave these things alone. And um, 
And so we got to show them that's okay. But then once they realize, oh, that's okay, and we run multiple attack drills, then we have to run our stabilization drills. And one of those is Crazy Aunt Sally comes over, and she hasn't seen you in 10 years, and she's so excited, and she just wants to give you hugs and love on you, and your dog's not allowed to bite her. Right. We also do a bunch with like, you know, here's your box delivery boxes. And I do it, you know, like the nice delivery guy. I do it like the, the overly assertive delivery guy. Here's your package. Right. And they're like, whoa. And uh, but again, you know, the guy does something stupid. The whole idea is we create kind of all the stupid situations that could happen uh, that we can think of. And the dog is not to attack in those situations, but they are to defend when you, the person actually aggressively comes in and attacks you. So that's the crazy Aunt Sally drill. All right. So and that would be something you would want in your house layer dogs right? The home invasion type drills. What does a dog do when somebody comes in the house? Now, it's one thing for, for you to be home and somebody comes in, right? Then even if your dog doesn't immediately react, if you if your dog has been trained for home invasions, you can take them, right? Or if the person is coming to attack you, the dog goes, well, I may not have normally attacked this guy if he just came into the house, but now he came into the house, my people are here and he's being aggressive. I'm going to go take him out, okay? So that's kind of a, a different uh, thing than doing the suspicion drills. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right. And then, so then you have your personal layer drills. So let's, let's go ahead and put all of this together into a couple of scenarios. Okay. And so we, um, we got through almost everything. This is my last couple of bullet points. Um, one thing I will say, if you guys have questions, thoughts, or things you want me to comment on, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time because we're already over an hour. Um, but you can go ahead and put those in, please put anything you definitely want me to respond to in all caps so that when I'm scrolling back through, I can see those pretty quickly. So we have a couple people on YouTube and um, one on Facebook, and uh, we have quite a few over on the Instagram side. We have a lot of activity going on over there. Um, but this is the time to go ahead and put some of those things in because sometimes there's a delay, and, uh, and then I'll try and go through those at the end. So putting it all together and running through some scenarios. So first of all, um, your attack and defend postures. Remember, when you're patrolling, you're kind of in an attack posture, right? So... In an ideal world, I would want in a, in a small patrol, so let's say there's three to eight people in this patrol, I would want there to be one to three dogs in that patrol. And, and so I would have at, at minimum one dog that knows how to patrol with us, and then I would have that dog out patrolling. And maybe all the dogs know how to patrol, but only one dog patrols at a time. And then I would have a couple of dogs move with the group so that should the dog up front make contact, and, and keep in mind, like when we're talking defense and we're talking real world scenarios, the contact that dog might make is you see it get shot right in front of you, right? It walks up to a person that's like, you're a bad guy. And before the dog can react, the person has been kind of hearing things moving and he's looking, looking, looking. He sees a dog. The dog looks at him and he goes, pow, and shoots the dog, right? So that may be how you make contact. But the reason I want my additional dogs are because if that's how we make contact, deploy those dogs put down a layer of fire. As the dogs come in, I cease fire. I let those dogs come in and make contact. Then we go close distance and see what the heck we're dealing with at that point. Right? So that's your attack kind of situation. And again, if you guys want a lot more detail on the patrolling aspect of things, I can try and do one of these. I just need to know what you guys want. Um, if this is something that you're like, that's kind of cool, but it was largely a waste of my time, then I won't do one on patrolling. Right? Then you got the defending situation. So what does this look like? So let's say you have uh, six gangbangers trying to get onto your property. And maybe it's an initiation. Maybe they're just trying to rob you. Maybe everything has gotten really bad and food shortages are terrible and they haven't eaten in three days and they know you got stuff, right? And they're going to come and try and take it. But they got guns and they're pretty good at fighting. Okay, so this is your you're kind of setting your scenario up, right? They come in. And I want my perimeter dogs to be ready. So let's say they throw poison meat over. Okay. My dogs have been poison proof. My dogs are still intact. They shoot one of my dogs. The other dogs, first of all, I hear a gunshot. My, all of the other dogs react. Hey, there was a gunshot over there. Right. And then um, the dogs that are on perimeter close on that spot and then go start engaging that threat. Now, let's say worst case scenario, right? There's six of these guys. Uh, one of them is seriously wounded, but the rest of them killed the rest of the dogs. And they decided this is our last place to get food. We ain't leaving, right? We're, we're making it in and we're get, we're eating. And so they, they're not running away and quitting. Now, of course, there's a decent chance that, you know, unless somebody's really, really committed, 
that alone, even if they killed a couple of dogs in the process, but a couple of them got really ripped up really good, there's a good chance they're going home, right? But we don't plan for the, the good events. We plan for if everything goes bad. So they go, you know, hey, man, that's injured. You stay here. We're going ahead. And, uh, and now you don't have any more perimeter dogs, right? And they start moving in. But what you do know is a bunch of shit just went down. And now we're all on a high alert and we're all in positions where we can defend our property. We have our dogs in positions. We have the dogs that are in the house that aren't going to be deploying. And when we make contact, we can do multiple things. We can use the dogs as a distraction and they make a great distraction. So people will often say, oh, well, I'll just shoot a dog if you deploy it on me. Most people in a gunfight can't hit people in a gunfight. And a dog is half or a third the size of a person and they move twice as fast. Now, if the dog is running straight at somebody, then maybe they're going to get shot. But a lot of dogs, especially if the person is at a distance, will naturally flank. And when they do that, they kind of run out slightly to one side and then they come around and they hit the person kind of from the side. Right. And if that happens, then the person, as soon as the dogs start moving, they start going toward the threat. Those people have to make a decision. The people that are the attackers that are the bad guys, they have to make a decision. Am I going to shoot the dog or am I going to shoot the people shooting? And they may choose one or the other, but they have, they can't do both. They, they can't, unless they've predetermined you guys will shoot dogs. We will shoot people. Right. And then that's pretty coordinated attack. Then they can't do both at the same time. And even if they did do that, if I've got six dogs and there's only five guys left now, two guys ain't shooting six dogs running full speed at them. Right. Especially not while I'm shooting at them too. And if I'm, if I have to pick people to shoot at, I may be picking the people and targeting the people myself that are not aiming at me, but aiming at the dogs, depending on the situation, um, depending on how good of shots they are, right? If they're shooting well at me, um, but if they're good shots and they're probably going to hit your dogs, if they're not good shots, then there's a, a really good chance they're not going to hit your dogs, right? The other thing to keep in mind with distractions are if a dog gets into a group of people that are all bad guys, even if that dog ends up getting shot in the process, there's a really good chance that that dog is going to cause a fratricide event, which is where they shoot each other, right? Because once the dog's in there, if they're in panic mode and just shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, and they start shooting and everybody's shooting in different directions, even though they're all kind of shooting at the ground, your legs are still down there. And there's a pretty decent chance that they end up shooting each other a couple of times in that situation. So that's a, they're a very good distraction that way. But also all of the attention turns in toward the dog. And now we can start shooting and we know our dogs are only so tall, right? So as long as we keep our gunfire above where the dog's head would typically be, then we have a really good chance we're not going to shoot our own dog and a really good chance that we can still shoot them. And if they start going to ground, well, then they're in big trouble when dogs are deploying. Um, okay, so you've got your guys have continued coming in. They're moving forward. We deploy our dogs. We start shooting. And <clears throat> at that point, uh, unless they have really superior numbers, if you've got four or five people defending a property, and you started with six and now you're down to five guys and you're deploying dogs and you're shooting back them, there's no way those guys are getting in. Now, probably your biggest threat at that point is how many of your people and your dogs got injured and how, how are you going to take care of them, right? How are you going to replace the ones that you lost? That sort of thing. So having the ability to breed, even if you don't typically do it, um, is important in these situations because you may not want to breed very often and take care of all those dogs. But if you lose dogs, you want the ability to be able to breed so that you can replace your, your teams, right? You can replace your dogs. Okay. So let's say you do have, let's say, let's say switch the situation up, right? Now you have somebody, it's, it's nighttime and everybody's chilled and relaxed. And maybe you have somebody outside kind of keeping an eye on things. Maybe not. Um, if you're living normal life, probably not. Right. Um, and your dogs outside start to bark and hear them barking, but you go out and check. There's nothing there as far as you could tell. Yep. You're even high speed and you get your night vision goggles and you look around. You don't see anything because it's not hard to hide from night vision if you know how to move in the woods. And um, and so you look around and you're like, mm, I don't see anything. You go back inside and kind of relax. And the dogs start barking again. Go out and check again. And, uh, and this is actually a probing technique, right? You create a response. People come and check. But you create the response and then move away. People come and check. There's nothing there. They go back inside. You create the response. You move away. People come and check. Nothing there. Create the response. You move away. People come and check. Nothing there. About the third or fourth time, they're going to stop coming and checking because they're going to be like, there's nothing going on. 
In fact, lazy people, they won't come out the second time. They'll be like, I already checked. Nothing going on over there. Dogs just barking. Freaking dumbass dogs making noise. Uh, I need to go to sleep. And you get mad at your dogs when they're trying to tell you something's going on, right? So that's a technique. So let's say these people are good at that and they probe. Maybe there's only two of them, right? And uh, But they're coming to steal something out of your barn. So some something really valuable that you need. Um, but they're not trying to come into the house, attack the family. They're trying to get to the barn and take something out of your barn. And, um, and then they... Maybe they don't kill the dogs, but they're able to distract the dogs um, with meat. Maybe you're in this situation, you didn't have your dogs poison proof, right? And they didn't even poison the dogs. They just threw meat for the dogs to run and get so they could get past the dogs. Okay. That's your perimeter dogs. Your close in dogs, which hopefully are not out engaging with the perimeter dogs, right? They're staying close to the house, which your barn is probably close to the house. They see these two guys running. Now they can deploy on those guys. You see how this, once you have multiple dogs like this, it becomes really hard to create a scenario where the guys coming onto the property are successful without a lot of personal loss. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go get in trouble with law enforcement, but this would even apply to law enforcement. If you have a couple of dogs, they're kind of easy to take out, um, especially in a suburban setting. If you have 12 dogs and they each have jobs and positions around the property that they do, that becomes substantially harder to deal with, right? And uh, so just kind of keep those things in mind as you go through. Um, so we covered dealing with probing. That's what you call that, the probing, where you come in, create a response and pull away, come in, create a response, pull away. Um, be aware when you're kind of looking at these things that a lot of defense and attacks is playing psychological games with each other. Okay. You want anybody who would attack you to think you're way stronger than you are. And the people who are attacking you want to play the games to try and get you to either let your guard down or to think that they're attacking from a different location than they're actually attacking, right? So you would call that a diversion. So maybe they send two guys in one direction and six guys come from the other side, right? And so they start shooting. Your dogs move to engage. The people move to support the dogs. And you're like, woo, there were only two. And then all of a sudden you start hearing shooting at the house. Right. So that's another reason you may not want your close dogs moving to the perimeter necessarily. You may want them staying at the house. Right. So using those techniques that we talked about with the invisible fence and teaching them, you stay within this perimeter and you can move to a threat in one direction. And those dogs are basically staying in reserve and waiting to see, is there anything gonna, else going to come that we need to deal with? Right. So there's lots of ways to do these different things. And as you start working through things, you go, well, what if they do this? And what if they do that? And if you've heard my other talks on scenario-based training and uh, kind of planning for threats and things like that, I will tell you, make your plan and then ask, what can go wrong? Now, what can go wrong? Now, what can go wrong? And each time you ask what can go wrong, you go, what can I do about it? And you have to be realistic in terms of what kind of finances do you have? What kind of infrastructure do you want to put in place? You can always find weak spots in any plan. And you try to shore those up to the ability you're able without making it ridiculous, right? You don't want a, you know, 15 foot deep, 10 foot wide tank ditch around your whole property um, and Claymore mines set up under the bridge that leads over that into your property. Like, I mean, you could go there if you want to, but that's probably way, way, way overboard and way more than you would ever need unless you know the government is coming for you, Right. And so um, you don't need to go crazy with this, but when you start thinking through these things and then incorporating the dogs into the layers of defense that you have, you can see that it gives you a massive advantage. And starting with one, two, three dogs that are well-trained and then adding in young dogs, puppies, into that mix and then getting them trained up enough that with the confidence and working beside the older, more experienced dogs, uh, they'll come into the work is a great way to do this on somewhat of a budget, right? Because all of these things are going to cost you money. Any kind of real defending your property is going to cost you money, but it's a way to cut that cost down substantially by doing it that way. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and check our comments and then we will see what we have with the, uh, and then we'll do our conclusion. All right. So I had a lot of people here on, excuse moi, on Instagram. Um, so, uh, Tracy said, ha ha prepper porn got her uh, attention there. 
um, that's what basically what you call it when the, they try and create a bunch of fear in these crazy scenarios, you know, like EMP, we're all going to die. And, um, and sure, it's possible that, you know, North Korea will get a nuclear weapon that's strong enough to uh, fire up over Washington, D.C. and detonate, you know, 20 miles over D.C. And, and wipe out the eastern seaboard's electric grid. That's possible. Um, is it likely? Mm, not very, right? Um, you know what's more likely? You're going to lose your job. That's pretty likely. Or you're going to get a terminal diagnosis or somebody in your family is. Uh, or, um, you know, it's more likely your house is going to catch on fire and burn down with an electrical fire or a forest fire or something like that, right? So these are the things that are much more uh, worth preparing for than uh, worrying about an EMP, at least. Once you get kind of set up for losing your job and being out of work for six months, um, there's not much more you have to do for an EMP. Maybe a few little things, get a metal trash can, put some blankets in it and put a few electronic things in there so they're not fried, right? Um, but if an EMP went off, it would be bad for everybody. Uh, thanks, Pat. We're, we try to keep that uh, unconventional stuff going, right? That's the whole idea uh, behind the podcast. Um, hoping, oh, hopping on, got to go. Oh, yeah, sorry, Pat had to leave. Um, Crazy and Sally Drills, we talked about that. Find the shooter. Are the air sending toward the gunpowder scent or are they tracking footsteps? Okay, so Tracy's asking, how do you do an initiated, um, fire firearms initiated thing and teach them to hunt? So when they're hunting, primarily what they're doing is they're looking for a scent. So we describe when we do tracking with dogs, we describe scent as hot scent and cold scent. And hot scent is a new fresh scent, right? And dogs can detect hot versus cold scent. They can also detect whether it's getting hotter or colder. And they will almost always, it's very, you have to train a dog to track into a colder scent, right? Why would you want to train track into a colder scent. If I'm using my dog's tracking capability to take me home, then they're tracking into a colder scent. They're tracking me into a colder scent, right? We're going the opposite direction that we came from. The scent's getting older and older and older as we go. And, uh, and you can train a dog to do that. And I tell them, take me home when we do it. And then good home, good home, good home as we move into that. When you're looking for bad guys and they're just running around and searching, what they have to learn is they're looking for the hottest scent that they can find. And then they're running to see what that is. And when that's, when they're used to human scent, they're looking for a hot human scent. And then once it clicks in their mind what they're doing, then they automatically just do that. Now, they're already going to have a pretty good idea of where the fire, the firearm was fired from because their sense of getting direction is a lot better than ours with the way that they can directionally control their ears, right? So they hear a gunshot, they're like, whoop, they turn those ears in that direction. They hear that echo coming off and they're like, he's there. Now they may not know exactly where the there is, but they can get close enough that then uh, using their sense of, of scent and tracking, they can hone right in and then get to the person. And, uh, and they do it amazingly fast. They're actually really, really good at it once it clicks. It takes them a little bit of time to, to make sense. But once it makes sense, then they're like, got it. And um, okay, so that was it. Uh, I appreciate you guys joining. Remember, we are on every Thursday at 5 p.m. We have only just started and we get pretty uh, good um, responses from people. Well, my wife will tell me when I get home how many people were on Instagram because I don't see the number of people that are actually there, um, like the total, but she always tells me when I get home. So we had about five come in on YouTube, one on Facebook, and it's typically about 16 to 25 or so on Instagram. And then these, of course, stay up in the feeds for people to watch and listen to later on. Um, this will be edited and up on the Protection Dog podcast. It is episode 104. Uh, so I think that's like three, four weeks from now. So uh, if you're listening to this on the audio, there's probably not any puppies left um, from what I talked about at the beginning. But if you are on these live streams and you would like to get the live real-time updates on things like that, then make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Float, MeWe. And I generally try and get on. I didn't get on MeWe and Float is in the um, the 1.0 um, upload phase right now. Um, but I usually try and run around to all my social media before I do these and go like, Hey, 15 minutes, I'm going to be live. Everybody get over there if you want to. Uh, and that does really help. Um, today we were renting a car for a big trip we have. So I got here 30 minutes before and getting running around, getting everything set up. Um, took a little longer and I didn't have time to get to that this week. So I apologize for that.
but I will try and get a little bit better about setting up those reminders and updates and things so that you guys can get on. All right. I appreciate you guys being here. Remember, if you have emails, uh, questions, you want to tell me how much I suck, you can email me at joel, J-O-E-L, at fortressk9.com. Also, please visit our websites, caninecademyonline.com, for all of your dog training needs online. Also, if you would like to uh, do Zoom calls, uh, have somebody log onto a Zoom call with you and train you that way. Uh, my franchisee in Houston, Texas does that. You can find him at, at Canine Philosophy, the letter K, the number nine philosophy on Instagram. And you can book uh, with him. Let him know that you heard about him through me so that he knows he's getting uh, business pushed that way. He also does training in Houston. I do training in the Orlando, Florida area. And he is starting to do board and trains. So he's not doing protection uh, board and trains yet, but he is doing uh, many other board and trains. So if you have... Uh, a dog you would like boarded and trained, um, contact Pat. Again, that's at Canine Philosophy. Um, also check out FortressK9.com. Uh, that's where you can find out information about all our trained dogs. If you want information on getting a puppy, it is FortressK9.com slash puppies, P-U-P-P-I-E-S, and that will take you to our puppy page, and you will get to see what is a basic puppy, what is an advanced puppy, how much do they cost, and you'll see some pictures of our dogs there. Um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, MeWe, Float, YouTube, Odyssey, all the good places. Share these with your friends. Please share these with your friends. It really helps get the word out. Uh, if you can give us a rating, make it a five star or whatever the highest stars there are, and um, let people know that you like it. If you don't like it, just stop listening to me. Um, that's fine. Not everybody's for everybody. Um, but if you want to tell me how much I suck, you can go ahead and do that. And then I'll go, huh, this person didn't like me. And then I'll delete your stuff. But I do occasionally uh, get people who disagree with me, but want to have a conversation. And if that's you, uh, I'm very happy to do those as time permits. Um, that would primarily be via text or DMs um, or email, something like that. So I don't have a lot of time, but I, I'm happy to kind of work through and discuss with people and uh, and share ideas and bounce um, you know situations and problems off each other so that we can all learn and get better uh, if that's the intent. All right, guys, I really appreciate you being here. Until next time, remember, train hard and stay safe.